Your new or existing home is one of your most important assets. Yet too many people rely on sites, shows, and tips from people who are not in the real estate business when making important decisions. It's time to get real and trust a professional. This is Real Real Estate Today with host Deb Tomorrow. In this series, you'll learn about making smart decisions when it comes to buying a home, selling a home, or even staying in the home you're in. Now, here is your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow. All right. Hello. Welcome to Real Real Estate Today. I am your host, Deb Tomorrow. You can always find us on Facebook. That's Deb Tomorrow Realtor and follow along. I highly encourage you to follow along or check out the Facebook page with some of these shows we're doing because we post a lot of links. Um, We've been doing a lot of interviews. And so we link back to those people so you can find them and ask them questions yourself if we didn't answer your questions. I'm here as usual with the lovely Miss Karen Russell, best damn lender in the state of Indiana. Hi, Karen. Hello. I feel like we haven't done this in a while. We haven't. We have. I haven't seen you since last week. Oh my god. Well, I was sick I mean, last week. I know, but we did. It's a, a good thing you didn't see me. It was <laughs> yeah. not pretty. But as I've been telling everyone, now we're pre-recording this show, so it's going to air on the 27th, and today's the 20th. So, I've I can tell you anything you want to know about curling. Because yeah. I was sick and bad watching curling. I was like, man, those Japanese ladies, they just, they were beating the women in the third end without the hammer. And I know what like, I was saying. And I, I haven't watched that. But then I saw that, that Facebook meme and I thought, oh, this is what Deb's talking about. And right. then I sent that to you. And right. I don't know. I found it funny. I mean, that looked really funny. It was a, it was a Swiffer right. and a, what Roomba. is that? The okay. Roomba thing. Yeah. I think is what it was. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's getting in. You know, because curling is like. I can do that. I really can't. I probably no, couldn't. I, couldn't. I would fall flat on my face. <laughs> Although I will have to say there was big discussion because one of the Russian uh, or what are they? Olympic athletes from Russia. Because, you know, the sure. curlers are big in doping, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> she's very gorgeous. And they were discussing whether she looked like Megan Fox or Angelina Jolie. But she was gorgeous. And she like totally tripped over one of those big stones and oh like gosh. fell. And everybody oh. in the arena was like, <gasps> you know, at the same time. And uh, and so I was like, oh, they're human, too. <laughs> I can do that because I can trip and fall over a stone. Anyways, we're going to get right at it today because um, we are in the middle of no, this is going to be the final series of a three part series of kind of what we're calling alternative um, housing options. Uh-huh. So not just you know, your normal tract option. And so the first week we had Daniel Weddle from um, Carpenter Owl, Tiny Homes. He's been featured on the DIY Network this month. And that was a really interesting show. Uh, the 20th that uh, we're actually going to record here in a couple hours is uh, going to be about Bloomington Co-Housing Project, which is really interesting because it's not a commune. That's my whole goal of the show, to get people to understand it's not a commune. commune. Um, it's a really, really interesting and cool concept. But today we're actually talking about homesteading. Um, and th- one of the big reasons I wanted to talk about this is because we are a small city kind of nestled in the hills of southern Indiana. And there's certainly a charm and, and an ability to live in a semi-rural way. And, mm-hmm. and a, But homesteading isn't necessarily about rural. But I find that a lot of um, buyers will come to me and, and on their wants and needs list, they want to be able to have chickens or goats um, or have some organic gardens or some things like that. And sometimes I worry a little bit because they're first time buyers. And I think, do you know what it takes to maintain? Yeah, that's a big on taking uh, as a first, yeah, as a first time buyer, but possibly right. they do. Right. So I wanted to bring in some people who are doing it, uh, and they're actually past clients of mine as well. And I want to really dig in on what it means to do homesteading, which from some of my research, it can mean a lot of things. And that's one of the big objectives that I want people to leave with today is this feeling that you can kind of homestead wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Even if you're in an apartment, there's options and there's ways to bring homesteading into your life. And I think that's something we shall be looking at doing. Um, But I also want to talk about how to buy property with that in mind and other expert advice. So without further ado, I will introduce, there are mutual clients, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Yes. we love them. Jill and Scott Stowers. Welcome. Hi. Hi. And they're nervous as heck. So we're going (laughs) to go really easy on them because I'm like, we're just chatting. It'll be fine. We've chatted all the time. It'd probably be better if we had beer, right? Most likely. That would feel a yeah. little bit better. I'm all right. I, I, I had a little last night. I'm not feeling too good today. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> that happens Celebrating the, the brand new uh, w- uh, warm weather. Oh, my gosh. And I know that's the other that. thing, too, is it's like 74, 76 degrees outside today in February, and we're all just jacked up with 
what our bodies are supposed to be doing. So, well, tell me, you've got a business called The Wood Frog. So tell me a little bit about who wants to take this. Just tell me about your business and what you do and what you offer. Yeah, we're a farm and homestead business. We're located in uh, Nashville, Indiana. So we're about a, a mile from downtown Nashville. Um, and so as a farm and homestead business, we have uh, all kinds of just a whole range of products that we offer that are related to homesteading. Um, we grow a lot of things. We are um, completely organic and non-GMO. Um, but we have berries, we have an orchard, we, we raise animals, um, we have um, hens, laying hens, so we have eggs available, and we raise um, hogs and sell those by the half and whole each year. Um, and we do some value-added products as well, some soaps, breads, jams, that type of thing. And then we have a woodworking business that goes along with it. And if people want to see what you have to offer, your website would be the best place to go for that? Yeah, we, we are on, uh, we've got a website, it's uh, thewoodfrog.com, and then uh, we, we've got a um, Facebook and Instagram, so we're always posting things on there as well. And you guys have some great, in terms of the woodworking stuff, some great stuff there um, for presents, um, especially if Mother's Day, Father's Day, some things like that coming up, there's some really cool yeah, we got a lot of gift stuff. Kind of, yeah, yeah there, there's some really neat stuff like that, too. The Wood Frog, we've been laughing for a month because the uh, two weeks ago, our show, we had, oh, what was it? The Carpenter, Carpenter Owl. Owl. <laughs> and now it's the Wood Frog, and we were getting them all jumbled up, and we're like, it's the Wood Owl, Carpenter, Screeching, who, what? So anyways, this is the Wood Frog. Um, and so this really is a family business. Right. It is. So what, how do you, you know, Jill, what do you do versus Scott? What do you do? And, and I'm sure that the kids have responsibilities too. The kids do have responsibilities. Um, so we have our kids, John and Annie, they're nine and almost eight. Um, which is further than seven and a half. Okay, uh, that's important to note. Important to Especially note. Especially because she's sitting in the Especially room. Especially because she's she sitting beside me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Scott is really the primary guy working the land, working the farm, doing um, most of the manual labor. I work um, at the hospital full time doing HIV work at Positive Link, and so I feel like a lot of what I get to do are the more fun things that he saves for me the things you make cheese I make cheese I make cheese I make bread I do a lot of things with food yeah um because I love food a lot um but so he's doing a lot of the like manual labor grunt work getting that infrastructure built and I get to kind of come in for a lot of the like final glory yeah fun reveal types of things on the land and the kids do a lot of work with um they kind of are starting to figure out their pieces that they really enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. Whereas before they would just be with us with whatever we were doing. Um, our son, John is in classes right now and raising bees of his own hive oh, wow. this year that he'll be getting his own hive. Um, and Annie really likes to work in the garden and plant and harvest and kind of handle that end of things. They both like to gather eggs, but so they get to do different, different pieces. And they both help in the kitchen a lot. They both help in the kitchen a lot. Which fun fact, completely unrelated, but not related, <laughs> but totally related is that Jill's niece was on Chopped Junior, yes, the TV I, show Chopped. I watched it because you told me. <laughs> so yes. that one with a giant bow and she won her, she, she did. won her show and then she went on to Champions and, and I think did really well there as well. So anyways, yes. it kind of runs in the family. The family likes food. Yeah. We really, we really like food a lot. <laughs> so let's talk about um, what, well, I have another fun story to tell too. So, and we're going to get into this in the next segment. Uh, they're like, what is she going to tell know. about us, right? <laughs> uh, so I met Jill and Scott because we listed their house. If, has it been three years, maybe? Yeah. Three years-ish, we listed their house and then helped them find this new property. Uh, when we listed their house, it was the beginning of... I don't know what I'm going to call it chicken season for 4-H. And do you remember we had baby chicks inside the house that we were trying to sell because it was too cold for them outside. Jill wrote the sweetest note. She had this like (laughs) tub with these baby chickens in it. And she was just like, I'm so sorry. It's too cold for us to be outside right now. But it didn't. It uh, It added charm, right? It added (laughs) charm, right? We were like, look, you can have your own homestead here. So, um, yeah, that was pretty, pretty funny. Also, the best picture, I don't even think I use it in the listing, but her canning shelves of all the foods that she's canned were so gorgeous. I don't remember. I don't remember seeing that, but I remember, I I know who bought the home and we've gone through that house since they've moved in. And um, now, now I'm curious on which bathroom had the chicks in there. And it was the bedroom downstairs. It would have been John's bedroom. Okay. (laughs) 
across from where Mike's office is now. But anyways, okay, we digress. All right, let's talk about uh, how do you define homesteading? Because I think everybody kind of has their own definition. Yeah, um, and just to be clear, I mean, we're, a, we're kind of a modern homestead. So homesteading definitely has its defined sort of meaning that dates back to the, the mid-1800s with the Homestead Acts. And really, the, there's common threads between now and then in terms of um, that Homestead Act was really intended to get some of the land that was opening up in the West into the hands of the small independent farmers and rather than having that go into the hands of the large scale wealthy farmers. And so that's really sort of um, the, one of the core principles behind what modern homesteading is today. So um, we see it as a kind of a maybe a broader scale movement. So we think of it as a movement away from the larger scale sort of corporate way of doing everything toward a smaller, um, a more local community of, of growers and makers. So you're kind of moving away from that um, corporate production mm-hmm. model toward you know, either making it yourself or looking to some of people in that local community to help, you know, make some of those products. And that's interesting because a lot of times I see definitions that talk about uh, self-sustaining as a primary definition of homesteading. And that's not necessarily what I'm hearing from you, but you're talking about more on a local community level self-sustaining mm. um, but not an individual like you know we watch a lot of a lot of the Alaska shows and they're mm. homesteaders truly you know it's them and nobody else for hundreds and hundreds of miles but you're for, focused more on community which is interesting um, especially coming off the Bloomington co-housing show you know that we had mm-hmm. just in, so we, we, we uh, do see it as kind of a continuum so on okay. one end of that continuum um, we would say that, you know um, maybe self-sufficiency could be the goal but it's it's not something you can just jump in and do immediately it, it's it's a kind of a, a building process so it, it takes time so right right um, you but, still eat takeout pizza and things like that yeah. right we still eat takeout <laughs> pizza <laughs> pizza nights a big night at your house as I as I gather from Facebook it's exciting. <laughs> it doesn't take much. Um, and when did you get into this idea of homesteading? You know, I think it kind of to piggyback on that in terms of it being a continuum is we've always been outdoorsy. And you know, I grew up with a garden and had to snap green beans for my parents when they were canning. And so we've always had some some level of a connection to it. Um but I think that when we had kids, you, we started to be more very consciously aware of what are we feeding them? What has gone into that production? What, you know, what are the ingredients? Do I know how to pronounce them? And what can we do for ourselves? Mm-hmm. You know, where we control that process and we know what's going into it and where can we not and where do we want to source that and find responsible growers that we want to source that from? So I think that for us, really, when we had kids was when we made a more significant jump from kind of dabbling, you know, I always had a tomato plant or two because mm-hmm. that's what you do when you live right. in Indiana Exactly. Um, to really looking at that. How are we, how are we modeling our lives around what um, our goals are? Awesome. All right. Well, I think we are at our first break, so let's go ahead and take that. And then when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about your transition from what your last property had and then what you were looking for and how you found uh, your new property. Uh, Hopefully that's your dream homestead and we're not going to move again, right? We're not moving again. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, stick around. We'll be right back. This is Real Real Estate Today, your home for smart real estate. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. Go to RealRealEstateToday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions, and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit RealRealEstateToday.com. In the spirit of Have Couch, Will Travel, Dr. Carol Lieberman creates a haven of sanity in an increasingly insane world. Each day we are bombarded with news of events that have never crossed our wildest nightmares. Society is spiraling out of control and everyone is reeling from it. But now there's an answer. 
The best way to keep sane in this insane world is to tune in to Dr. Carol's Couch on Voice America. Dr. Carol, a certified media psychiatrist, will broadcast live from her Beverly Hills office every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Call or log in and get help with whatever is sending you reeling whenever you need a soothing voice to calm and advise you. That's Dr. Carol's Couch every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time here on America's Voice, voiceamerica.com. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your questions. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. All right. Welcome back to Real Real Estate Today. I'm your host, Deb Tomorrow. Make sure you're following us on Facebook. We're going to post some good links. There was a blog post, and I don't know if I'm going to get to it or not, so I'm going to mention it right here because I wanted to make sure that anybody listening to this show has some ideas for resources. And certainly our guests, um, Jill and Scott, they have their website, The Wood Frog, and that's a great resource for people to go to if they have questions. And I know they'd love to answer questions as well. Anybody can reach out to them. There was, and I don't know, I sent this to you guys, this blog blog and I don't know if you had a chance to read it I just felt like it was kind of spot on in terms of the experience it was um Oh my gosh, now what's her name? Because I don't even see it. Oh, Colleen. Oh my gosh, I'm going to butcher this. Codacast. C-O-D-E-K-A-S. It was posted in 2016 on her blog, Homestead Living. But she attends tips for buying and starting a homestead on a budget. And she really talks about her and her husband's experience. Um, of They actually bought some land in Arkansas and thought they were going to start their homestead there. Realized they were too far from their family. And so they uprooted and they moved to Oregon. But prices are different. So they ended up with a much smaller piece of land. But, you know, what they're trying to accomplish. And it, and it had great information on, like, financing even like a USDA financing stuff that was accurate. It's often the internet's not accurate, shockingly. And so whenever I find an article, I think this is pretty much like how real life works. So we call the show real real estate because we're trying to tell you what's real. So we've got uh, Jill and Scott here today from the Wood Frog to talk about their homesteading experience. So I want to back up and talk about your first property, the one that we sold three years ago, because that's, is that where you really kind of started doing a lot of the homestead activities? Yeah. And did you have that in mind when you bought that house? I think we did to, to an extent. Like I knew I wanted to have space for a garden. I had always wanted to have chickens. That was pretty much yeah where we ended I mean like that was yeah. what I knew we wanted to do or right. we knew we wanted to do um and that was a couple yeah. of years right two and a half yeah yeah um and how long were you there nine years I think nine, nine, nine ish yeah. yeah a while okay uh and so it served the purpose for quite some time but then it seems like you really started to outgrow it in multiple ways yeah, we we knew that we wanted more land. We knew we wanted to be able to do more. And we talked to our neighbors that had land and tried to see, like, could we get additional mm. land there? Mm-hmm. Um, and there wasn't anyone adjacent that was interested in selling. And we weren't really interested in having separate lots of land yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and that, that land was also very wooded. Mm-hmm. So that I think 
Yeah, the usable land was, yeah. it was two and a half acres, but there wasn't two and a half right. usable acres. Okay. So now let's jump into this process of when you, you know, so you were seeking a new location because you wanted more land. And what else were you looking for? Kind of what was your priority list at that time? We had a lot of different things we were looking for. So there was a lot of moving pieces, things that we could, you know, sort of give in on some, you know, give up on some ideas and if the other ideas were strong, um, you know, on the property. But we really wanted more land. The location was important because we did have the woodworking business at the time and we knew we wanted to expand it. So we were looking for maybe a little bit closer customer base uh, that we could reach where we were at. Um, And then, you know, everything else that goes along with building a homestead, you need outbuildings, you need, you know, that that room to grow. Mm -hmm. Um, So all of those were factors in what we were looking at for the property. And then you were also taking into account schools and proximity to your families. Right, because that yeah, was one of the right, things. Right. Remember, I, I remember that. <laughs> I forgot all that. I mean, what else was on our that list? That was one of the things too, because you know your families were north of town, and mm-hmm. you lived way, way on the very southern, like literally edge of the county. And so you wanted to try and get, if you could chop off twenty or thirty minutes of your yeah. drive to your families, that was important too. Um, I'm trying to think of what else was on the list, but yeah, there was there was a lot there. And we did explore a lot of different options. Not too many. You drove a lot for us. We went to Brown County a lot. Well, (laughs) but it was a pretty scenic drive. But I feel like we probably only looked at like eight or ten houses. We finally stopped bothering you to to go look at the. We we started going the houses first. Yeah. And kind of you know stalk We'd stalk the house, and then if we thought we really wanted to see it, we would. Yeah. Because there were a couple that were a little frightening. We saw a lot of properties. Yeah. Yeah. We may have seen eight or 10 with you. (laughs) Well, you know what what was amazing too, is that we had this, you guys were trying to do what I tell everyone right now, like you cannot do, which is make that transition and sell a house, buy a house. So you, you put your house on the market. We casually looked for homes. Meanwhile, you got an offer or two. I think you got two two. uh, on your house. And then you had about two weeks to find something before you were going to be homeless. And I don't know if you had a plan B on being homeless. We didn't have a very good plan B. Not a good no. plan B. No. And I know it was like, I was super stressed out because I was like, there's all these animals and I don't know what we're going to do with them. Meanwhile, the person who was buying your house, I was also selling his house and he had an offer. And it was this huge, like domino effect thing that um, we all survived somehow and yeah. still seem to like each other. So that's really great. But um, that is certainly uh, a challenge. And I think you guys, from my perspective, I think you were very lucky the way it worked out because this was the house you you ended up in wasn't even the first house you tried to buy it was the third house we tried to buy it was the third house that we tried to buy oh it was that's Mm -hmm. right because the log cabin yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the second one had bad inspection Mm -hmm. and then we're pretty much going to make this third one work (laughs) because we were down to the wire because we had to go some we had to look somewhere and i think that's when we brought karen in the game and we said how fast can you do this loan because yes i was i think i was sweating bullets and that was fine until the buyer of your home came to me in the middle of that and then that time frame was even shorter and I was just like okay you know like we got this it was it all yeah. worked out it, yeah it, it, it all worked out and it, yeah. it did it, really it did. did so <clears throat> before we get into the specifics of you know what the attributes were of your actual home here's some another I, I love to throw in my fun facts which is basically my fun facts are just like here are the random things that Deb remembers from three <laughs> years ago when she's doped up on cold medicine like she is right now there was a whole big thing about the location of where they moved because they couldn't there was this um, this window that they couldn't move within. They either had to be close enough, like a couple miles, or they had to be further than like ten miles because the bees. Yes, Do you yes, because that? moving bees, you have to move them less than five feet or more than five miles. There you go. That's what it is. That I did so not. So they know. could not. I could have found them the perfect property two miles down the road from where they were at the time and they couldn't have bought it because the bees would never find the new home. They would keep Because going. at five feet they would keep per going week it would have taken us house. like a year to move the bees. Yeah, they would have just had to move them five feet at a time. <laughs> That's so interesting. Right? I'm sorry. Chickens didn't but, care so much. How did you move the chickens? Oh, we just, we, trailer, we actually, right? we got some friends together and we loaded the coop straight onto the trailer. Okay. And yeah, it was, none of it worked. None of it was <laughs> great. It wasn't graceful. None of it was pleasant at <laughs> no. all, but we got there. Well, because that was not an easy drive from your old, 
homestead to your new homestead because it's windy back roads with people probably driving really fast on your tail the whole time while the chickens are like (laughs) (laughs) we entertained them while they were going slow on windy roads oh i can imagine feathers are flying and oh my gosh interesting okay so what did you give up when you bought at your current homestead what because we were talking about before the show and you know I'm just a realtor what do I know but I was surprised when you came to me you said this is the house this is the one we want to make an offer on I knew I knew there was some desperation involved too but uh, (laughs) I I just I was I was approaching it from a different angle because I'm not a homesteader so I'm looking Mm -hmm. at it differently so I think you know one of the primary things was the outbuildings just weren't right um, for what we needed. We needed a wood shop, we needed a barn. It had a small Quonset hut, mm-hmm. so a metal building, but it was leaky and, and there wasn't power to it. There was no it? electrical there. Yeah. Um, and with uh, with the home that we were in now, I mean, the, it was the price point was was at the high end of what we wanted to spend, which meant really what we were saying is that, you know, at that price point, we need to have everything in place because we're not going to have a lot of liquid cash to Mm -hmm. sort of move everything around and get things done. Um, So I think that, you know, that has been a little bit of a, I don't know if it's a domino effect, but kind of a blessing and a curse in a way. I mean, as a, as a homestead business, we, you know, if we're not flush with cash, we're not going to um, be able to go ahead and do some of the things that may have wanted to do, but it's caused us to maybe slow down mm-hmm. a little bit and not heavily invest so quickly into things that maybe um, we end up heading in a different direction. So it, it's been a good thing in that sense. But I think the price point, um, the home's a little larger than what we had been looking for, mm-hmm. but that was, you know, it, like I think we were talking about um, it being the right bones where, you know, yeah. everything seemed like we could make everything work. Yeah with the land and the space and, and everything situated the way it was. So. so are you still running your woodworking business out of the Quonset hut? I'm in the Quonset hut. Yeah. Okay. It's still, electric now. <laughs> it's got electrical in there, but it's almost impossible to heat. So there's some, still some challenges, you know? So is that a project on the horizon to build a bigger shop? Um, not the near horizon. So there's, there's still going to be some cruelty and suffering that goes along with the woodworking <laughs> from, for the, for the next few years. Yeah. But it's interesting to me, um, and we talk about this in other aspects of home purchase, how the things that people, I've been doing this series, and I guess this kind of fits in with the series um, called uh, House Stories. And so I've been having people on that have bought homes with me just to talk about their Um, what they regretted and what they would do differently, because I think we can all learn from each other. And so this kind of fits that a little bit, too. But it's interesting that the things they thought were a big deal when they bought the house or they thought this is going to have to change immediately. Once you get in, you almost always figure out how to make it work. And it becomes less of a this is an absolute you need your priorities change. And I just always want to encourage people to kind of keep an open mind. You know, um, one of the big ones, you have to have a fireplace or have to have a tub in the master bathroom and I'm like you call me when you take that bath because I will never hear from you you know but there's things like that 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 people think is a showstopper and probably not and I think the way that we really approached it with buildings being you know the house and the outbuildings and all of that not being exactly what we wanted at the time is that we can build a lot of that and we Mm -hmm. can make those changes you know like the linoleum is now hardwood like that stuff Mm -hmm. that we can do but we can't change the land. Right. Like the land is what the land is. Right. And so looking at what our goals were and what we wanted to be able to do with the land, we were more apt to make sacrifices on what the buildings and the structures were. Excellent. Um, And how much land did you initially have? Eight acres. Eight acres. Okay. And now you have? 25 acres. See, now this is crazy because you were able to accomplish what you weren't able to with the last one, which was convince the neighbor. (laughs) To sell you some land. Yes. It was actually the right. owner of the property that had our house. He had that adjacent oh, property. It was the same guy. Yeah, yeah, he was we, nice. So then he became our really neighbor and then I gotcha. now not our neighbor. Right, <laughs> right. Okay. So that, that worked out really, really well mm-hmm. because you didn't have to expend quite as much money up front. You could kind of get settled. And then, yeah, so that was real. See, that was it was meant to be, wasn't it? It was. I think it kind of was. All right. Let's take another break and then we will come back. And I want to talk um, a little bit more about what attributes the land has and and what you're getting off of the land. So stick around. You're listening to Real Real Estate Today, your home for smart real estate. (music) 
stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain firing really fast. All the time. The number one internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. Go to realrealestatetoday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions, and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit realrealestatetoday.com. Can you truly be a change agent in your community? We think you can. Tune in every week for Envision with co-hosts Thomas Rosenberg and Ronnie Langer Kroger. The show is all about building an inclusive and just future by connecting people with ideas. Connect with what's happening in your community, your country, and around the world as we speak with amazing guests who are fostering change and making their communities better. Envision is heard live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Variety Channel. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. News. Opinion. Your voice counts. Call toll-free 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. Okay, welcome back to Real Real Estate Today, your home for smart real estate. We are talking with Jill and Scott Stowers of the Wood Frog. They have a homestead in Brown County, National Indiana. It's about 15 minutes down the road, but you're over in Bloomington all the time, aren't you? I'm in Bloomington all the time. Every day. <laughs> so I was worried about that drive when you guys moved out there. You're good with it? Oh, I'm Hasn't good with been the drive. a big issue? It's really not different than the drive I had before. True, that's true. You had a rough it's drive. It's just from before. a different direction. Yeah, around a different side of the lake, basically. <laughs> right. Exactly. Good. Because I was worried about that. I just thought, that's a lot of driving, but it makes sense. All right, let's talk chickens. Everybody wants to know. I cannot even tell you how many people come to me and they say, well, I want a place where I can have chickens. Now, in Bloomington, we're crazy. I remember one of the very first things I ever saw when I moved back to Bloomington. So I was here for school, grad school, left for about 10 years, came back, turned on the news or, or the opened the newspaper, and there was a picture of a city councilman who is over seven feet tall. We call him Tall Steve. I went to college with him. Uh, he threw great parties. And he was je- dressed in a chicken suit. And I thought, this is what I'm moving to, is seven-foot-tall chickens. Okay, but there was a big debate in town over how many chickens you could have inside the city limits. So we are so pro-chicken in Bloomington that you can have a certain number. I don't know if it's five or ten. It's five. Five. No roosters, um, just the chickens inside the city limits, but outside, of course, more. So... You were saying that chickens are kind of a gateway drug into <laughs> homesteading. They really are. Okay, yeah, so you start absolutely. with chickens. Now, Rachel here, too, associate producer extraordinaire. Rachel also has chickens. How many do you have? Six. Six. They're pretty. I hope you're not in city limits. <laughs> She's not, no, she is just outside the city limits, thank goodness. And, uh, yeah. So tell us about your experience with chickens. So I love chickens. Okay. Um, I also don't do as much of the less fun work with our chickens, but they are, I think that they're the, they're easy to care for. They're kind of entertaining to watch, quite frankly, like they're funny. You posted um, something yet, was it yesterday? Are, yes. You had an angry chicken? Yes. He posted it. He was he out, he took, he got an egg under our broody chicken. Oh, she, she threw, threw a it. tantrum. Oh yeah. <laughs> she started squawking at me and then she, she began to engage in a behavior I've never seen before. So she jumped out of the nesting box and then was just sort of yelling at me and then grabbing straw and tossing it over her back. And she, she did this for, I mean, it was probably five, 10 minutes and I got video of it. Um, apparently this is some remnant prehistoric chicken um, <laughs> nesting behavior that ritual that we've never seen before but um, she was definitely so mad nothing at me, weird so. with the egg 
the egg was fine. Eggs fine. It wasn't delicious. Like a, it didn't have a baby. It was delicious. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <a baby. laughs> yum yum yum. Um, so okay, now I have to ask you this because I'm a city girl. Even though I live on five acres, we do not have chickens because I have a little bit of a phobia about birds in general. Um, I had a parakeet roost on my bread and my hair when I was in college, and it couldn't get rid of it, and it was. So I have some trauma. I know there's some therapy that's needed. But anyways, uh, obviously it's parlayed into chickens uh, and a phobia against fish, but that has nothing to do with anything. So what do you do when you go out of town? It depends for how long. You can't take your chickens chickens to a kennel. I mean, there's probably a kennel for that. If there is a kennel for that, it's probably in Bloomington. Probably, right. So, right. Um, And and they do take care. I think that that's, like, you, you do have to take care of them. They're fairly useless yeah. taking care of themselves right. and everything likes to eat them. Yeah. Um, so if we're out for an extended period of time, we have others in the community that, you know, will take care of their goats. They'll take care of our chickens and hogs, you know, that you kind of farm yep. sit yeah. um, for each other. If you're gone for just, you know, if we're gone just for the weekend, they're really fine. Okay. Like they have, they have an enclosed area. Um, so they're, they're fine for short trips, but not for long trips. <laughs> We do have our setup because of the the predators and those types of issues. You know, if you're away and not looking in on them, you just want to make sure you have a very secure place for them to be. Because there are ways to make sure that they have enough food and water and Mm -hmm. that they're going to be okay in that sense. But um, we also have a neighbor that will come up and look after them for a free dozen eggs. So there's there's (laughs) always barter. Right. And I think that's a really important thing for people to think about when they get into um, homesteading or or even just, you know, wanting to kind of think – take things up a notch is that you do have to have that community surrounding you um, to help you, you know, maintain things because you can't always, if you ever want to be yourself. able to leave. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, maybe you don't wish to leave, but I think that you definitely need to. Um, how, one of my other big worries is like, you have a lot of land to maintain. I don't know how much of it you actually mow and how much of it you actually, I mean, how much time like in the summer do you spend working on your land to maintain it it's you know and that it really is a part of the philosophical shift when you know and we even as um you know being going from the one home to the next um we've shifted our focus away from growing grass into growing things that are more edible and and useful um so we don't mow as much as and we don't necessarily need to because we don't have a neighbor that's staring right down on us with with the tall grass and and we look at the tall grasses and things as being beneficial and as a part of the the ecology of what we're doing um but we also rotate our animals so our hogs and our, our chickens around as a part of that rotational grazing to where they're helping to maintain these areas for us you know so if we've got a um you know the the land that we're um working on now is you know thick with thorny things and that type of thing but hogs quickly take control of that and and we'll beat that down and and then if you follow that with chickens they'll they'll kind of pick through and, and help to keep things clear so we use the animals so that's a part of our practice interesting so it's important i think then to sort of approach your property with a big picture and think strategically. So was that part of your thought process when you started to get, like, say, let's get into hogs? It makes sense on a couple of different fronts. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, kind of moving where we're at, you know, and not having the the huge cash reserves to just go ahead and, you know, pay to do anything we wanted to do and having that homestead mindset. When we're looking at bringing something onto the property, a new animal, it really needs to serve a few purposes. It Mm. needs to serve a a food purpose. It Mm -hmm. needs to help us with the land. And then there needs to be some source of an income that comes from that animal. And so hogs are great because they provide all three. And I actually find hogs to be a little lower maintenance than than the chickens are um, um, in a lot of ways. And this year we're looking at with the new property, we've got about three to four acres that we need to clear of some thick brush. And so we, we've doubled the number of hogs that we're going to bring on okay. in the season to help kind of get that under control. Okay. And you still have room for people to place some orders for hogs or are they all spoken those before? went fast oh, um, they yeah, went we, fast before we advertised yeah, oh we, wow our hogs are pastured they're non-gmo fed yeah. they're organic fed um so they're going to have probably the best life that a feeder hog can yeah. have and right. so we were kind of surprised that our pricing had to go up but we sold all of the hogs within a week wow yeah so we do that in late winter and and we didn't okay. even have to post we just went yeah. um to the people who you know had purchased last yeah. time and they all knew somebody that wanted 
wanted right. one as well. So interesting. Um, what about cows? Are you ever guys going to get into cows? Oh, oh I want a cow so excited. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Annie's in the background going, Mom wants a cow. I really want a cow. Yeah. I do really want a cow um, because I like to make cheese. Yeah. Okay. And I like to eat cheese a lot. And so I want a cow because I would have like limitless butter and cheese. Yeah. Um, which are some of my favorite foods. Yeah. And the key for good cheese is having that non-pasteurized milk, right? Absolutely. Isn't that the challenge? Like, I don't, do you, yeah. do you do a community share? Um, I did until the one that I had closed, oh, okay. which is, it's been a little bit traumatic for me. Yeah. Like you have your parakeet in the hair. I right. have that my milk share closed. Yeah. So we common, things. common things. I feel you, sister. Um, so yeah, look, it is definitely a goal for me. It is not something that we'll be able to add infrastructure wise this year. Um, but I would love to have, um, a cow and then raise one for meat. Mm-hmm off of her each year so we would have the meat and then also the dairy from her what else do you have on the radar in terms of once um well i mean we're going to add some structures this year so we're looking to do that um and we're you know one of the things that we want to do for this next year is to have a farm stand on the property so we really want to move away from the farmer's market and csa type model into having a farm stand on the property and beginning to uh, ramp up our business that way. And we're also adding a lot of um, on-site, um, hands-on educational opportunities for people to have people out to the farm yeah. to learn and um, engage in some of the homesteading practices um, throughout the year. So those are a couple of things that we're looking to add this year. And so the big one coming up this year is um, 10 Simple Ways to Start Homesteading in 2018. So right. kind of a series. Yeah. Is that an in-person series or tell me a little bit about it's that? It's going to be a mix. So one thing that we really want people to, um, how that we want people to view us is as a local resource, not only a resource for the food and the products that we make, um, but also for education. So we we're, we're, um, we've kind of got a quiet, soft launch of a, a dedicated um, blog site. So that is being developed and we're kind of tweaking it now and adding content. So that's going to launch soon. And the the ten simple ways was just sort of a um, a way to launch that blog or that yeah that blog site, um, but really the idea behind it is to um, simplify homesteading to, so that people who have uh, an interest in getting in becoming engaged in in the community of homes of homesteaders can find some simple ways to do that. So in 2018, if they're you know take one step toward um, uh, accomplishing that goal, and, and we want to w- provide a series that helps people to do that. Whether it's um, educating them through the, a blog, if they want a little more, we'll do some on-site, some hands-on educational things on the farm, um, that type of thing. So that's the idea behind that. Yeah, the blog post that I had um, referenced earlier it has a quote in it that says, "Starting a homestead, even if you don't have the quote unquote ideal homesteading property, is possible." Being a homesteader is a mindset no matter where you are. And uh, and I love that idea. Um, you know, even if you're in an apartment in New York City, there are some things that you can do um, in terms of sustainability, probably not having chickens. Um, but there may be some like um, CS- CSAs, right? Is that mm-hmm. the right word? thinking of the community shares and mm-hmm. things like that, that you could still take advantage of that can support other homesteads. So there's things that you can do um, anywhere. So if any people want to um, get more information about that 10 simple ways to start homesteading, um, that's starting next week. Is that mm-hmm. coming soon? Um, no, it's not starting next week. We will have everything. We're going to have the educational opportunities beginning. I believe it's in March and April. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so in terms of the hands-on things that those are going to begin soon, we'll have the, um, a blog site up and ready oh, gotcha. by the time this airs. So, oh, wonderful. So, yeah, There's we'll some pressure. Have yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, I think we're going to go to uh, a final break. And then when we come back, um, I want to know everything you know about making cheese. Okay. Because I love Let's talk cheese, about cheese that much. I know. I think I've been like, I, I've been wanting to get out because I know you've had some classes and I've been wanting to get out there. And, uh, cheese. And, yeah. Have you been selling cheese at the farmer's market? I do not sell cheese at the no, farmer's you market. You make it and I eat do, it? I do. I make it and eat it. Sweet. We do not have the appropriate certifications for me oh, to sell that. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. There's a lot of rules. They don't. There's, there's rules. Yeah. Food safety is a real thing. They're yeah. good rules. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, but the, you are, are you going to be at the Brown County Farmer's Market this year, this upcoming year? 
Right we're still looking into which we're probably going to dive into the multiple venues. Uh-huh. So we're looking at uh, one in Bloomington. We're looking at and two in Brown County. Oh, wow. and, and we're considering some others sort of in peripheral communities. But we're looking at those three probably the closest. This and year. what are the things that you're selling at the farmer's market? The produce? We have produce. We have berries. We have fruits. Um, and we're um, looking to add uh, soaps. And we oh, have nice. some chemical sort of uh, chemical free. Um, bug okay. repellents and yeah. the different things that we do. Awesome. So, right. And we have jams and breads jams always. And breads. Jams and breads. Awesome. All right. Let's take our break and then we'll be right back with Real Real Estate Today, your home for smart real estate. Streaming live, the leader in internet talk radio. VoiceAmerica.com. Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. Go to RealRealEstateToday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions, and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit RealRealEstateToday.com. What's your coffee story? The one that defines who you truly are in a relaxing setting. It's where you share your memories, plan for the future, and talk about the now. My favorite coffee story is here with host Aniko Samoji. We invite you to listen in and share your coffee stories too. Bring your friends or just stop by as we talk about coffee and the inspiring stories that touch our lives every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus, topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your question. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back to Real Real Estate Today. I um, really enjoyed today's show. When we're wrapping up this last segment, I wanted to talk just a little bit more with the Stowers, Jill and Scott um, of the Wood Frog. Check them out at woodfrog.com. Um, they've got some great information um, if you're interested in homesteading on any level whatsoever. Um, they are a resource, whether you're here in uh, Monroe, Brown County, um, or if you are uh, elsewhere. Um, so I wanted to, I've got, I promised we were going to talk about cheese. Gonna and we're going to talk cheese. about cheese, but but before we talk about cheese, I want to talk about something more important than cheese. Um, and that we were talking about this during, I think, a break earlier. Mm-hmm. And Karen, you had a sh- story about your family. And yeah, I and I am just like so removed from how to garden, how to do anything. I think I could easily kill a fake plant. That's me. Like, that's my green thumb. And it's just really sad and unfortunate because my my Korean grandmother lived with us my entire life and she passed away at age 15, but she, no, when, you were 15. when I was 15, sorry, <laughs> but she had, um, this humongous garden. We only had one acre of land, but most of it was either a flower garden or an entire like food vegetable garden. And she was out there all the time. And if the same neighbors are still there 40 some years later, and they always say, we remember your grandmother being out here and, and doing this and that. And then I think, 
you know, how sad. I don't know anything about any of it. And my mother, um, you know, as she's gotten older, she just doesn't do that as much. So she'll buy her items from, you know, a local market. But it's just kind of sad that I didn't take the time to be on hands on like your children are, you know, and they're learning these things and they're chasing chickens and, and they're, you know what I mean? And I just think what a, what a great value that, you know, an extra, um, extra skills that they're going to have as they as they get older, whether they choose to maintain or uh, live on a homestead or not, but they will have, they'll know how to do all of this. And regardless. a perspective. Yeah. And I think an appreciation. Um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about your hogs because Charlotte's Web and all, you know, but, um, you know, they have an appreciation for that cycle of life mm-hmm. and, uh, and plants and what goes into it. And they're not just taking that piece of whatever, you know, vegetable on their plate for granted because they know how much hard work went into mm-hmm. to that. But you had said, Jill, about the skipping a generation and that you're seeing that as, as sort of prevalent in society that yeah. our grandparents did it, but our parents didn't do it so much. Yeah, so I think that there's, and one of the things that we see a lot when people do come out um, to our homestead is that there's an interest in it and a very loose connection in that it's my grandparents, when I was a kid and I went to my grandparents, they did X, Y, and Z, and I don't know how to do it. And it's really not, you know, for all of history, you pass that down to your kids and people Mm -hmm. do it, and it really only took one generation not doing it. Mm -hmm for that knowledge of how to do it to get very lost very quickly. But a lot of it's very simple as well. And so just having that resource to, you know, how do you seed start? You know, you don't have to buy a plant for 350. Mm -hmm. You could buy a package of seeds for 350 and seed start if you know how to do it. And those are some simple, simple things that people can do. But just with one generation not engaging in those activities, you kind of lose that skill set pretty quickly. My mom was heavily involved in 4-H. I was not. So I think I'm the generation that didn't skip. <laughs> uh, she did a lot of canning, but she also instilled a very healthy fear of botulism in me. And ah, so yes. I, I've i tried to can a few times. Um, it seems to have sealed, but I'm petrified to open it up and eat it. <laughs> Seriously, I swear. I well, legitimately, if you are terrified, open it up, cook it, add a boil for 10 minutes. Yeah. And then you can eat it. Okay. You'll be well, good. Because like one of them was I made some pickles and I just was never able to bring myself to eat them. And I don't think you should boil pickles for 10 minutes right. and then eat them. I don't know <laughs> yeah. that that would be so good. So obviously more issues. <laughs> can I, can, Rachel, can you add that to my therapy? <laughs> um, because, yeah, obviously there's issues there. So so I like this idea that they're so, sort of um, sentimental. Uh you know, people come and they see it and they think, yeah, I want to uh, do things like that. You know, because my mom did it when we were young, but she didn't do, continue it and, and she doesn't. And you can it. dabble. Yeah. You know, it's not I think it's not an all or nothing lifestyle. Like you don't have to buy 200 acres and cut right. down trees and build your own house. You really don't. Like, well, can I tell you, you can get a basil is... plant and stick it on your windowsill. Right. And that's a st- like you can take right. the pieces that really work within right. your life and run with them. Can I tell you I had an epiphany about two weeks ago and it's the stupidest thing. So I'll share it and I'll look like a complete idiot. But I had um, we had talked about Kro- Kroger click list. Love it. Right. But I ordered some a pound of green beans and they were out and of that package. And they gave me like three pounds of green beans. And I was like, well, there's only two of us. That's a lot of green beans. And so I'm watching them like go bad in my fridge. And then I was like, oh. I could freeze these. Like I could can them. I could freeze them. Like I didn't grow them. And it never, so stupid. I shouldn't even admit this. Um, I mean, it just never occurred to me that I could perhaps can or um, freeze items that I didn't necessarily grow myself. <laughs> I mean, yeah, never like, and farmer's markets are a great place to right? go and so make then bulk I was purchases. Like, so the next time strawberries are on sale... I could just buy a bunch and that's still going to be a better deal, you know, financially, but also, you know, mm-hmm. that I have, it was just, it changed my life. There just like, go. just like cheese changes everyone's life. Cheese. cheese. Okay. What kind of cheese do you make? I make a lot of different kinds, but some of and my yogurt. favorites and yogurt, because my kids eat a lot of yogurt and my husband <clears throat> and lots of yogurt. We go through lots of yogurt. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorites to make are Parmesan and cheese curds. Mm. completely different ends of the cheese yeah. making spectrum but some of my favorites both and of them are some of my favorites do you get use the same milk use the same milk so it's so all it's about what enzymes. cultures you use okay so you have your milk you have a culture 
rennet, and then some salt because salt makes cheese taste better. Right. Salt makes everything taste better. Exactly. Um, so there's two different types of, like, primary types of cultures, unless you're getting into fancy cheeses, yeah. and then you add some molds to get a Swiss, oh, right. all the things, right? Oh, my goodness. Um, but for just kind of the standard basic beginner cheeses, there's two cultures, and it's what temperature you heat it to, how yeah. long you let that culture sit, how um, what you do with the curds after so you get like a giant pot of curd yeah. and then you cut it and you stir it. And so maybe you're heating it up or maybe you're cooling it down. And so what you do with those curds is what makes the different kinds of cheeses, but it's always the same ingredients. Amazing. And, and you can get that depth of flavor. You know, like a par- Parmesan was like, you know, like really sharp. You and... can from aging. Okay. So a lot of times on my canning shelves, there's also like a waxed cheese right. sitting there as well oh my gosh and how do you learn to do all of this youtube well scott yeah, actually is the science guy so when we in it's we're we're a good match on food preservation and some of the different pieces because i'm a very much art of food person uh-huh. and he's very much a science of food person i honestly don't understand all of the science that's happening with cheese and he will geek out over all of the science that's happening <laughs> with cheese and i'm like the curds are the right size right you know <laughs> No, it's funny because yours and I were talking about this last night. Yours is a chemistry major. And he says, people come up to me all the time and they say, well, you should know this. You're a chemistry major. Like, why does when you cook this, it does that? And he's, right. and he's like, they don't teach you that in like, in, when you're a chemistry major, that, you know, they don't teach you that. There's a class at IU when I was in school a million years ago that was the chemistry of cooking, but it was very much for the liberal arts major who needed a science right, like that's the sci- I'm like, that's yeah. the science class I would exactly, take. Exactly, right? Um, and not, uh, you know, so we were having that conversation. It's really interesting. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're out of time already. Thank you guys so much for coming in. I think it's really interesting. Um, and I think it's really helpful information for a lot of people to hear. And I just want to leave everyone with that. You know, you don't have to start with 25 acres you don't have to start with two acres you can do a lot just where you are Um, and I think checking out the wood frog website is going to be one of the best ways to get started on that homesteading adventure so thank you so much keep us posted and uh, make sure you send us some links to your programs and and if you're teaching other cheese making class and we'll make sure we put that up so that everybody can find I know Rachel's like I'm in Uh, (laughs) awesome thank you everyone for tuning in to real real estate today this is Deb tomorrow we're your home for smart real estate thank you for tuning in to real real estate today please join your host deb tomorrow for another edition every tuesday at 12 noon pacific time 3 p.m eastern time on the voice america variety channel until next week take care of your home it's one of your most important assets